the introduction Chris thank you very much uh, how you guys doing today pretty good yeah awesome awesome um, I'm always asked if I could go back in time and change anything that may have happened what would that be and why my answer is always I wouldn't change anything um, failure teaches us it shapes us it tests us in our weakest and most vulnerable states only through struggle and failure can we overcome dust ourselves off and begin back on our path to greatness my name is Matthew Kichi Hafey I am I've always considered myself half Marine, half Japanese. Half Japanese because I'm obviously half Japanese. I was born in Iwakuni, Japan. My dad was a Marine who was stationed over there. He met my mom there. And I feel from the two cultures, I've kind of developed a very regimented lifestyle. I wake up at the same time every day, eat pretty much the same time every single day, try to live by a schedule. I think it's from both cultures. Um, yeah, so I was born there, moved around from state to state, California, Florida, Illinois, Florida, settling back in Orlando when I was about maybe eight or nine. I kind of lose track. I'm gonna have to ask my parents when that was. I pretty much um, always had a guitar laying around. My dad played a lot when he was a kid, and I, I wasn't able to play then, obviously. I'm not that good. Um, so that guitar was always around when I was a kid. It's still around my parents' house now. Um, my dad always played, so there's always a guitar around. I remember when I was maybe somewhere between seven and nine, I picked up the guitar for the first time, asked my dad to show me a riff, and the first thing he ever showed me was the, the guitar part from Rock Lobster, that terrible B-52 song. <laughs> But uh, it was a cool riff, because I, I guess it was in a minor key, so I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, I spent most of my childhood being a typical Japanese kid, playing video games and <laughs> watching cartoons and eating a lot of rice and salmon. And um, that's one of my first achievements, uh, beating Mario, before I could fully really speak English very well. Um, my first experience of failure, uh, it's not this picture, it's not that yearbook picture. Uh, <laughs> My first experience of failure, um, I originally picked up guitar again to be serious about it, maybe 10 or 11, I guess to look cool, maybe to have girls notice me, whatever it may have been. Um, it didn't work. Uh, I tried out for a band, and at that time, the only kind of music I knew was pop punk, because being from Central Florida, everyone knows it's pop punk and ska. It's kind of the first thing you hear of when you're younger. So I tried out for a friend's band. My tryout song was Damn It by Blink-182. I thought I made it in the band, they basically never called me back, so I was really bummed out when I found out I didn't make it in, and so that was my first experience of failure. So from that, I decided, let's just see what happens with guitar. I, I kind of put it to the side. Around seventh grade, a friend lent me the Black Album by Metallica. I heard that, and that was my first introduction to ever hearing metal. I never knew that that's what music could sound like, that that's what songs could be about, that playing could be that good. So I started emulating that and started playing like those guys and starting to learn their songs. I'd lock myself in my room and practice anywhere from 30 minutes to minimum to, I don't know, five, six hours a day playing guitar. So I got pretty decent, played my eighth grade talent show, played a Metallica cover called No Leaf Clover, it's just me and a drummer. It probably doesn't sound very good if you listen back on tape. Um, after that show, the original singer of a band called Trivium asked me to try out. They existed for two weeks, they never played. They had already lost a lead guitar player somehow. And they said, hey, I, I think you'd be pretty good for the band. Why don't you try out? So I brought my guitar and went into this, this house of like 16, 17 year olds. And here I was, 12 years old, trying out for this band. Everyone was looking at me like really, really mean. And I was really freaked out. And uh, they were thinking to themselves, like, who the heck is this 12 year old kid? And why would we ever let him in our band? My tryout song is For Whom the Bell Tolls, another Metallica song. Sorry, if you guys don't know the, the songs, it's OK. Uh, I played the song and it went from one look of astonishment to why the heck is this kid trying out for our high school awesome band to why is this guy so good. So I made it in the band, uh, just the guitar player, then lots of lineup changes, became the singer. Um, yeah, so I made it into that band. So from that initial failure and being bummed up by not making it to a pop punk band, I then joined my first band and started developing my first job. Here's a flyer from a show that we played. There was like anywhere from five to 15 people at any given show we'd play. Uh, we'd sell like one or two t-shirts, maybe a CD. It was usually to our parents who already owned all the stuff already. And um, yeah, they'd have to sneak me in because I was like 13 to 15 years old playing. I don't know if you guys have ever been to the Fairbanks Inn, but it's on Fairbanks Ave. It's no longer the Fairbanks Inn. I think it's some creepy diner thing now. But uh, it was a cool venue, but like I said, five to 15 people typically. So chapter two, growing up in the public eye, don't let others tell you who to be is the lesson I want you to take from that. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a very small shirt I'm wearing there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we got signed initially in 2003 to an indie label called Life Force Records. We were excited that, hey, we were signed, our CDs can be available everywhere, so we thought the millions would be coming in any minute. I remember going to Best Buy the day that the, uh, the CD was supposed to come out, and it wasn't there. No one had it. It wasn't available on any site. Um, I don't know what happened to that. It just was very, very uh, difficult to find our album. We played three European shows. We actually opened up for one of my favorite bands um, who I'd sent the CD to before. I asked him, I was like, hey, what do you think? We just got signed with this new band, Trivium. And the guy actually said to me, he said, it's mediocre and nothing special. And I, I was like a 16-year-old kid, a huge fan of this band. I won't say what band it is. I don't want to give them any bad press. Um, so that, that really broke my heart. And I was like, man, how can, how can this happen? So that was our first taste of kind of seeing how vicious the world can be, how critical other people can be in the same field as you. So we got signed to a major label called Roadrunner Records and they started uh, kind of dictating, hey, here's some good ideas, like really play up the sex, drugs, and rock and roll thing. I don't know how this says sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It kind of says the opposite to me of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, <laughs> And uh, so they gave us this cool wardrobe, like they, they rolled this thing into this, uh, into this studio and they said, hey, here's a bunch of clothes you guys can wear, so wear this stuff and here's this striped shirt and I really don't know what I was thinking. So like things like, you know, we, when you're growing up you try really ridiculous fashion things and unfortunately for us we had to try that out on magazine covers and we had to really figure out how we want to present ourselves as people and musicians in a world that we had to grow up in their eyes. So nail polish, eyeliner, things like this. Uh, and this, so this is our first magazine cover we ever got. I think I was 18 or 19 years old. And when you've got a caption like Sabbath, Maiden, Metallica, Trivium, it's like, how do you live up to that after that said? How do you, there's nowhere to go but down from there. So in this magazine, this, this English magazine called Kerrang, they put us on the cover. They said we we're basically the greatest band that's ever happened. The next record, they put us on the cover again, and they said we're the worst band that's ever happened, and that we're terrible, and that we suck, and that we should be disbanding, and all this stuff. So we started seeing how not only did it just go from other bands and peers, but press could be something really nasty and be not that cool, and embrace you one moment, then completely want to build you up, build you up to fall on the next one. So we learned that maybe making ourselves look the way a record label or that people thought we should look, like you know, hey, straighten your hair and wear this pomade and this eyeliner, you look really cool. Um, I realized that wasn't really the best thing. So the lesson from that I want you to learn is be yourself. Um, do what you wanna do, look how you wanna look. Don't allow others to dictate that because once you start allowing that to happen, you know, you start to see things like this. And no, you know, like the first thing, <laughs> first thing I said was how I wouldn't go back and change, the, change anything in the past. I wouldn't change this because if that didn't happen, if I can go back and change that, there's no telling if we'd even be around anymore, because you need to mess up for good things to happen to you in any field you're in, no matter what field you're in. Um, here, uh, here's a quote that I said, we've become the band that it's cool to hate. This was, I believe, right before our fourth record. So we kind of had an extreme up on our second record, that first major label record. The second one was a, kind of a plummet in the US and the UK, but it sort of went up everywhere else in the world. Stuff does like that sometimes. Um, so it was really weird for us, because we started being and we started becoming outcasts to other bands. Other bands didn't respect us, didn't like what we were doing, because when we first came out, we had very high goals. You know, 18 year, old, 18 year old kids saying, we want to be the next Metallica, we want to take over the world, and that's pretty ballsy to say when you're 18, I guess that rubs people the wrong way. And um, so we started realizing that we were alone, and we started realizing that we had kind of a bad name going for ourselves. Uh, there's a really painful quote. I actually like this quote now because it's hilarious and I, I write a lot about food and I would like to make a shirt for this, but um, the story was in 2006 or 2007, we brought out a side band of one of my favorite singers of all time and they just finished like a 26 hour van ride and there was some food sitting around, some like, uh, you know, lunch meat and bread and that's, that's like a typical band guy dinner. And um, so they showed up to grab this stuff and our tour manager, I, I won't say his name either because he's, I don't want to do that, but uh, he went up to the band and said, whoa, 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 because they're about to grab a plate of food. No one eats till Matt Hafey eats. Now, it seems like a harmless quote, yes, uh, but from the point that quote was said, that spread like wildfire. Every single other band started hearing about that, and, they, and then, so still to this day, even a month and a half ago, I had another band guy come up on our bus and said, whoa, 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 nobody eats till Matt Hafey eats, and uh, I assure you it's quite the contrary. I really like to share food with people. Um, yeah, so things like that. It, it was really painful to hear that. It was painful to hear in places like Brazil. Our Brazilian promoter even heard that quote when we went over there for the first time in like 2011. So people talk and at the root of a lot of the problems we were having with a lot of the bands later on, they, 
I had one guy come up to me and actually apologize. There was a, quick story, sorry, I, I, I kind of get sidetracked. Um, there was a signing, um, a kid was wearing a Trivium shirt and this singer of this other band signed Matt Hafey when he saw this shirt. And I'm not sure what that was supposed to mean, but the, the fan told me about that later on. Then the guy later apologized, he said, listen, I'm sorry, it was, it was a matter of jealousy. You guys started young and yeah, so he said that's what it was. So every once in a while you'll kind of, it's nice when it gets resolved. So through musical lineup, crew, label employee changes, countless missteps and wrong turns, we slowly started figuring out what we wanted to be and who we were as people. So change in direction, lesson, allow everything to inspire you. This cover was actually, or this magazine article was actually modeled after um, an 80s or early 90s photo shoot that James Hetfield and Metallica did. And they were inspired by our fifth record's visual art, it's called In Waves. So when we were kind of about to, I don't know, kind of about to disintegrate, like we had to make a huge lineup change in our band, get rid of one of our founding members, not due to entirely him, but the chemistry between the four of us, we had to have a rebirth. So we had a, a, a lot of time off and I ended up befriending this kid that I'm sure a lot of you know and all of us wish he was still here, John Paul Douglas, uh, one of the most inspirational people I ever met in my life. So through him and my wife, I started becoming introduced to the world of visual art. Visual art is something that inspires me more than auditory art. A lot of people think that in the field you're in, you should be inspired by that. And it's not always just metal and just music that makes me wanna do what I wanna do, but it's, it's always visual art. Um, John Paul Douglas and I, we, we started working a lot, just, uh, just hanging out at first playing like a lot of Call of Duty and StarCraft and then started realizing that we liked things like, he started showing me his favorite directors, directors like Lars von Trier and David Lynch and Christopher Nolan and that stuff really struck a chord with me and started inspiring me to wanna see how much of that world I can inject into our world. You know, when people think of metal bands, they just think of the typical, I don't know, maybe like a Slayer or a Maiden cover. They don't really think of kind of this modern direction. So with this record, I was able to get a lot of creative friends of mine um, a friend that did costuming, her name was Megan Giese, she was my wife's roommate through college. John Paul did the photography of the, the entire record, the cover. Danny Jones, who a lot of you know, who's another incredible graphic designer who did most of, this most of this cover, the big blobby evil thing in there, and the, the typography of the record. So it was really fun to be able to curate a bunch of friends and make this artistic project, because I can't make visual art, so it's fun to make it together with people. Um, so through inspiration, like John Paul Douglas and I took a trip to Bell, Florida. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Bell, Florida, but I was definitely the most ethnic thing that city had ever seen before. Um, there's one gas station, a barbecue restaurant, and uh, a lot of woods. We, I remember we were taking a riverboat and the, the engine died somewhere like, I, I, we were completely lost. And we had to drag the boat off to the shore and we we're kind of worried like deliverance was about to happen. Um, especially because me and JP, we have a, a, we have a, a knack for wearing like really short, uh, bathing suit shorts, I don't know why, we just do, those, are those silly American apparel ones. So we wore those, so we were freaked out something was gonna happen. Luckily we both came out um, unscathed and unabused and we were able to keep experimenting with fun art. So this was just me laying in water. And uh, yeah, it ended up looking really cool. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it shows that when you're able to experiment with different artists of different mediums, it sometimes warrants some pretty amazing results. There's more stuff of JP and I experimenting. I was basically just, the guinea pig for this awesome visual stuff that we kept making. More work by JP and um, Danny really uh, led a lot of the, the photo shoots and saying where we should go, how, should, how we should do it. Uh, this ended up being the, the promo photo for the record, our fifth record. I wanted to go for, thanks to watching a lot of uh, like Trier stuff, I, I really appreciated the minimalism and it not having any modern structures or modern buildings. So we wanted to go for this futuristic dystopian kind of thing with no modern structures. Had a friend make all the costumes for us. Who's, uh, she's currently in the fashion industry in Seattle. So it's pretty fun. If you can't beat them, join them. So a lot of us here today in all of our fields, we sometimes wrestle with social media. Social media is definitely something you should embrace. Uh, here's all the looks I've had. Um, and a couple fans thought that's the way I will look in the future. <laughs> So with social media, <laughs> social media, there are definite goods and bads. Early on when my dad was uh, co-managing the band, he was always very embraceive of social media world. That was the, the days of MySpace, being online, having an online presence and allowing people to know what you do, interacting with those people and, and showing them who you are, showing them that you're not just this unattainable thing, but that you're just a regular person like everyone else. So there certainly are goods and bads. Um, and here's more stuff. So I, I kind of encourage, that's one direction I mean. Um, you know, I, I guess a lot of people who are maybe in bands don't like the idea of, I don't know, bad pictures of them. But for me, 
one day this fan made this collage of every horrible face I've ever made on stage. <laughs> And they're, they're like, hey, this is a tribute to you. I hope you really like it. And I was like, man, why would anyone think that's a tribute? So we started embracing that and showing people that, yeah, go for it. Let's make a bunch of silly memes of us. And I think it showed that we have personality because a lot of people thought we were just these serious, rigid metal guys. And it's like, no, we, we really appreciate this sense of humor. Um, so to embrace it in that good way, uh, you know, allowing it to, oops, sorry, I went too far, uh, allowing it to Show your, your supporters, your fans, whoever that may be in what you do, that you have a personality outside of what you do. Um, there are goods and bads, though. Uh, every, like, once every three to four months, I'll fall into, like, a Twitter war with someone. You know, you guys all know about internet trolls and people trying to lash out at you to get a reaction, and sometimes I'll fall in the pit. Those are the things, when I say there's 50-50 with the internet world, embracing the goods and the bads, you can't focus too much on negativity in the internet. It's not, a ma it's not the same as validation of people who support your company. So it's tricky. Uh, allow it to work towards your benefit, but don't really focus too much on the negative. I remember when I was uh, 2005 or so, someone made a meme. They, they photoshopped my face onto bin Laden, and they were saying, this is how bad Trivium is. And I was like, man, someone took the time to do that. And I was really heartbroken when I saw that, that someone thought we were that bad. They wanted to photoshop me onto bin Laden's body. Um, so those kinds of things, embrace it humorously, don't focus on negativity. If you guys have your own company or something online and you see comments that really are trying to get a rise out of you, you, you just have to block it out. You have to realize that they're doing that just to get a reaction. It's not really saying anything about who you are, or what you do, and just know that it's, my, my dad used to uh, quote my grandpa, I, I, I like this quote, it's not 50-50, oops, I guess that thing is on. It's not 50-50. Um, a third of the world's gonna love you, a third of the world's gonna hate you, and a third of the world's not gonna give a shit about you. So that's kind of the way I feel about the internet as well. Um, treat it that way. Don't worry too much on the negative, and embrace it in your way. You don't have to do silly stuff or find ugly photos of yourself and put them online, but I find when you do that, it kind of disarms them from being able to use that against you, so. Uh, chapter five, the respect of your peers. Um, so when you're wrestling with the negative in life and what you do, Allow the positive to, to kind of overcome that sometimes. For me, even if there's like 99 positive things said about the band or myself, sometimes that one, the one negative thing is all I, I focus on. I'm sure everyone does that. Uh, it's, it's, that's not the way to go about it. You, you need to really focus on the good things. So some cool things that have happened. Uh, here's Slash from Guns N' Roses wearing a Trivium shirt. I thought that was pretty rad. Um, I'm actually going to his show tonight because I'm mutual friends with his photographer and I heard that uh, he likes my signature guitar. I had a signature guitar come out recently, so I convinced the company to send me one to give to him, so I'm actually gonna be able to give him one of those, which is pretty rad. If you're a guitar, if you're a guitar fan, that's, that's, that's amazing. Um, there's a younger photo of myself and Kirk from Metallica, who is the lead guitarist who's responsible for why I'm even here right now, who made me wanna be in a band. He was wearing the Trivium shirt. In the photo next to him, that was taken by me with my, uh, with my phone. Um, at their show about a month or two ago. I gave him one of my signature guitars. I said, hey, this is just a thanks for everything you've done for me over the years. And he said, cool. And he ended up playing it on stage in front of about 100,000 people, which was really freaking cool. So I was kind of like jumping around like a, like a little kid when I saw that. <laughs> so it's cool that that can still happen. Uh, here's us and Jerry only from the Misfits. We've done a couple of Misfits covers over the years and he, he dug it and he asked us to do a couple more. So there's him on our bus. That was fun. Um, this is someone who I've always looked up to in my entire life. Uh, he's the singer of a, a black metal band called Emperor. We've become really good friends. He's become a mentor of mine, and he's actually producing a side project band of mine that I, I decided to start outside of Trivium. Um, I'm sure everyone knows Korn. Korn's an, uh, an amazing band that I loved a lot in like middle school, and I remember I convinced my dad to buy me my first seven string, and I started trying to collect their pedals. Anyone that's a fan of Korn or a guitar player knows that they use huge pedal boards, so I started collecting all their pedals, so thanks mom and dad for buying all that stuff. Um, we played some shows with them in like 2007, we did a tour with them. I, f I actually sang with Korn in 2006 when Jonathan had to be rushed to the hospital, and uh, later on down the line, one of the guitar players said, hey, I really dig your signature guitar, it's pretty rad. So when I heard that, I told Epiphone, hey, we should get this out for the guy from Korn. Gave Monkey, that guy. I gave him one of my guitars, and then their other guitar player, Head, I, I, these aren't their legal names. Um, <laughs> he saw the guitar and he's like, hey man, where's mine? And I knew he was kidding, but I decided to get him one anyway, then the singer asked for one. So I gave them each one of mine, um, which, you know, when your favorite, when one of your favorite bands of all time are kind of saying they dig what you do, maybe you should give you know, 
try to give them something of that. So they surprised me a couple days later with one of their guitars on stage. That was pretty amazing. Um, I'm, I'm not a huge, I mean, as an actor, he's pretty cool, uh, but he's not like, a, like an idol of mine. There's Brad Pitt's kid, and he's wearing a Trivium wrist guard, which is pretty rad. <laughs> I don't, know, I don't know where he got that. I don't know how he got that, but that's pretty cool. Um, what doesn't kill you, dot, 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 obviously, makes you stronger. So these little Japanese girls didn't kill me. Um, uh, this is in Rolling Stone, Japan. Uh, this is this band called Baby Metal. If you guys haven't heard of this band yet, you should probably look them up online. They do something like 40,000 people a night in Tokyo. Uh, it's like... Imagine anime theme music and a Japanese game show and Dragon Force and Arch Enemy all in one, and that's what baby metal sounds like. So they're like 12, 14, and 16. So they had me do this co-interview with them, which was pretty cool to be in Rolling Stone, Japan. Um, there's a picture from the beginning of our last tour that we just finished, Mayhem. That was in San Bernardino, California. Um, me as a cartoon, so it's kind of come full circle. I grew up watching cartoons, and now I am a cartoon. Um, there's the signature guitar I was talking about. So through the band, I was able to finally have a signature guitar, which is pretty amazing. And it's, it's been doing pretty decently. Obviously with me giving all the free ones out, we're probably losing any profit, but. <laughs> yeah. um, I was asked recently to become a guest columnist in a Japanese rock and metal magazine. It's called Burn, it's got a couple R's, and that's tricky for Asians, so. <laughs> And I really do mess up R's and L's. I'm serious, I've actually done that on stage. I'm half Japanese, like I said, so it's, it's like a genetic imprint mistake that happens. So burn might be tricky sometimes if you say it quickly. Uh, so yeah, this is a column that I read about. Um, I'm not sure what I'm talking about here. I, I can't read Japanese. I think what, what, my mom can, so she's the only person here that can. Um, oh yeah, this, this thing. So through Trivium, I, I decided that I want to start exploring other avenues of music. I've really always wanted to get into scoring, scoring things like movies or video games. Um, through my friend John Paul Douglas, who was recently doing a video with Hytale, and it also features a bunch of Orlando creatives, he asked me if I could do the score for this, uh, this commercial. And I was able to kind of go into something different and try some different things. And what I love about that video is that it just features a lot of Orlando creatives and a lot of people that were able to band together and make that. Make that. Um, here is, I, I've mentioned food quite a bit. I, I find that with an open-mindedness to food, it leads to an open-mindedness to everything else in life. If you have an open-mindedness to try everything that there is around the world, you're going to be the same thing with everything else, whether that's music or art or other cultures or other experiences. What got me into food initially is I remember being in elementary school and everyone was asking about what the other kids had for breakfast. Everyone was talking about what cereal they had. Someone asked me, I said, oh, rice and salmon, like always. And they're like, what? They're like, that's disgusting, why would you do that? And I was like, that's just what I've always done. So that made me realize what my normal was was something different for a couple other people. I wanted to find out what other people's normal was. And I've mentioned Metallica a lot as being my gateway into the musical world. Anthony Bourdain was my new Metallica of inspiring me into wanting to travel the world in relating to food. And thankfully, being in a band, I'm able to be in countless different countries all the different time, uh, all the different time, countless different countries all the time and try out what their normal is and what we would consider that as different. Um, yeah, so this is a Germany's version of like Bon Appetit magazine. There's me trying to act cool like I know about food and wine. Um, yeah. Uh, there's me eating. Again, it all comes full circle to me eating. Um, this is me in Japan. Actually, at the restaurant in uh, Lost in Translation, where, where Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson get in the fight, that's that restaurant, and it's in Tokyo. Um, there's me and some of my friends just hanging out. <laughs> and uh, kichikaos.com, that's, that's my blog. That's the site that I was uh, encouraged into working about, because every time I get home from a tour, I'd talk to my family, my friends about, oh, here's this thing I ate. And I'd talk about these stories kind of loosely and rambly like I do sometimes when I ramble and get off, get off topic. So they said, why don't you write about it? I think it was so I'd shut up about it. And so I started putting on a site. I broke the site up to the five senses. Um, C is my attempt at photography. Taste is whether food I've been eating or food that I make at home with whether myself or my wife and I. Um, here is the scoring stuff. So there's quite a bit of the score stuff I've done on there. I'm actually doing something for Toyota's social media coming up soon. I've been writing for a lot of bands on the side and doing some cameos with other bands, which is really fun. And it's all thanks to the, the initial opportunity of being able to be in the main thing of Trivium. So I find that 
with what you do, once you've kind of established a little bit, it's, it's cool to be able to see what other outlets you can have, what other channels you can expand that into, so it's not just about one thing. And to relate that back to the, the, the initial theme of today, and it was funny when I saw the sign, it said, failure, Matt Hafey, and I was like, man, what's Chris saying here? <laughs> what's he trying to say to me? Um, to relate it back to the initial theme, without those initial mess ups and mistakes and, and failures, we wouldn't, able to, uh, we wouldn't be able to become what we are today. So thanks to every mistake, thanks to every horrible look we've had or every bad song we've written or bad show we put on, it's made us stronger into becoming what we are today, speaking we as the band. And it's expanded me into be able to do all these other great side things. So that's what I encourage. Um, and doing things like Creative Mornings Orlando. So thank you all very much. I'm Matt Hafey. It was nice meeting you all. Some questions, so let's try to keep all the like the when's your next album coming out stuff down to a minimum. And, and he's, he's much more than that. So. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, anybody, anything about anything? Yes. Definitely, it's really important to establish a main thing first. And I guess it wasn't until record five that I decided to start doing the food blog. I'm not saying wait till your fifth record, but just whatever your, your version of when you feel like it's kind of set and when you've got your name and your brand out there that people can recognize and then start branching out to see what that closely relates to and see what other interests you like. Next. Mm-hmm. So many. Um, I always say Japan has the best food in the world. I, I don't know if it's because I'm half Japanese that I always say that, but I, I think there's just something so amazing about when you're walking down the streets of like Shibuya, it's such a mix, a juxtaposition of extreme technology and futuristic world where you have all these animated things of these uh, cute animals eating people like on video screens and you've got these ancient Japanese small little uh, like doorways that you have to crawl into and just eat something random. Um, yeah, Japan's got too many. Let me, let me think of something else. Uh, we were just in Istanbul recently, and we were able to do like traditional Turkish matzo, which is like a lot of sharing stuff. And I've always said, contrary to the no one eats till Matt Hafey eats quote, I, I like that everyone eats the exact same thing at the same time. And Turkey, they do vegetables better than anyone else in the world. I'm not just, I, I also eat a lot of meat. So probably there. And what I do when I'm somewhere that I really love the food, I'll usually buy their cookbook and uh, like try to find the best cookbook that the locals say that's the one to get and bring it home and try to make that. So Turkey was probably the best of this, this album cycle. Yes. Um, was there, like I know you started um, young success. Um, was there any point where you just didn't think things were going, like things weren't working? Lots of times, lots of years. Um, I joined the band when I was 12. I'm currently 28. It's, it was my first band, first job. Uh, it didn't really get to the point where we were able to like move out of our parents' homes until I guess 18, 19, 20 or so. Um, so that was, that was quite a while in into the band. We didn't really start touring until 2004. But the first three years, when we were living in a van, like showering in Walmart sinks and eating once a day. There were times where we questioned it, like, what are we doing? Um, from there, we graduated into this. You know the thing that takes you from airport terminal to terminal, that little shuttle bus thing? We toured in one of those, except the bunks were made of PVC pipes and two by fours. I remember when I was looking at the bunk ceiling, it was about this high off my face. I was just like, I, I, don't, I don't think I can do this. On that tour as well, right before we took the stage in San Francisco, um, we were touring, uh, it was uh, Children of Bodom, this Finnish melodic death metal band. Um, us and Amon Amarth, the Swedish melodic death metal band. So Amon Amarth had just finished their set. We were about to go on, and the entire crowd, this was 2004, Six was chaining F, they were using the word, trivium. And people were spitting all over our gear, spitting on us when we came out, the entire crowd. And so we still went out there and played our entire set. And those are kind of the obstacles that it really makes you wonder sometimes. But if you can come out of that alive, then it just gets even better. Um, and it's not like it all went away at one point. In 2006, we did a co-headlining tour with Slayer in the UK. and. People were throwing beer bottles at us when we went on, but we still got through the entire set, didn't let that steer us off our course. So 
In anything we do, we will find obstacles like that. And if you really love what you do and you really push at it and you make yourself the best you can be at what you do, um, even if it were all to end in the next day, at least you knew that you were able to put yourself into something. At least you were able to put that much of yourself into something that you love, that you know you could do that to something else as well. So there, there definitely are times and obstacles all the time. Yes? Since you just said uh, there were questions, was, were there moments where you had a question what you're doing? Are there moments or a moment that sticks out where you kind of say, oh, this is why I did this the whole time? Yeah, I mean, it, what's great about it is anytime there's, there's a really great show, uh, we just did a, a bunch of European festivals and the first festival that broke us out as a band was in the UK. It was in 2005. It was called Download Festival. Um, we were doing pretty decently in the UK, as you saw from that cover photo with the eyeliner and the hair, the swoopy hair. Um, so they bumped us up to open up the main stage at 11 in the morning. I remember it was about 10.59 and there was no one in this giant field. 11 o'clock started, our intro rolled, and 40,000 people all came running up this hill. It was like a scene out of Braveheart as we went into our set. <laughs> and from that show, the band kind of, uh, it didn't blow up necessarily, insanely, but it definitely started going on the path upwards. So we just played that festival again where we were asked to headline the second stage. And oddly, we're playing at the exact same time as Aerosmith, which is kind of freaky as Aerosmith. And um, I didn't think there'd be anybody there. And we still had about like 30 or 40,000 people during our set just a couple months ago. And Aerosmith had like 50, 60,000. So it was cool that people still wanted to watch us while one of the greatest bands of all time was playing. So anytime we get to play a, a giant festival like that and not just 5,000, but like 40 to 50 to 60, 70, 80,000 people know the words to our music. I think that's, it's nuts. Where we're in countries that they can't, we can't speak to each other because we don't mutually speak English, but they know all the words to the songs. Like we just played in Krasnodar, Russia, which has the worst airport ever. Don't go there for vacation. And, um, their baggage terminal claim is like a tin roof with no walls, a couple porta potties, and I saw this just this beefy Russian guy just hauling this slab of cement across the tarmac. I don't know what he was doing with that slab of cement, but he was doing something. Yeah, so don't, don't go to Krasnodar. Uh, it was a cool show, great people, but everything else was really rough. <laughs> yes? So can you talk a little bit more about that guitar you designed? And what yeah. About, and why you designed it that way? Of course. Um, the first real guitar that I ever got, um, this is really, really good guitar for like, a, like an 11 year old to have. My dad got me a Gibson Les Paul Custom, which is, I guess, like the best kind of guitar you can start with. So um, I wanted to model a guitar after that one. Uh, that's the one we recorded most of our albums with. I've, we've played most of our tours with. And I, when I was speaking to Epiphone, Epiphone's the company that is owned by Gibson. So their guitars are a lot more affordable, but not as, not as handmade as Gibson. My idea was with the signature guitar, because so many signatures out there, an artist plays one, the one they sell is like a tenth as good. It's a lot cheaper, it's not as good, theirs is better. I wanted it to be the exact same one that I would play on stage in the studio, it was the exact same one that's in stores. So it took us about a year or so, um, Epiphone and I, to make something good enough that they were able to make that still was affordable and decent enough to play live. So it's just a lot, a lot of effort and work went into it. But what I found that the fans really appreciate is that it's the same one that I'm using. That it's not, I'm playing a $10,000 version and they're playing a $300 version. It's the same thing all around. So it was inspired by the, the guitar my dad got me. Anybody else? Anything at all? Why does your band suck? I'll take it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I actually live about five minutes from here. Um, I've been living here since, how old were we? How old was I? Eight, nine? My parents. Uh, yeah, so, so about since then. Um, what I love about Orlando when I describe it to other bands, because European bands, they always think, oh yeah, Disney World, that's all you guys have. And there's so much more to it. I, I, I've been describing it as a secret cool city. I know that's not the most eloquent phrase that exists. But I feel like we're on the cusp of becoming something where people are always talking about quote, how cool Austin is or how cool Chicago is. Orlando has that capability as long as, like Chris was saying earlier, that we band together and stay here and that the creatives that are here don't leave, that we keep allowing our, our, our city to flourish. Orlando's food scene is getting really great. I have this ever, uh, ever changing list that I'm always sending to friends who are coming here of all the restaurants I think are amazing that are all locally owned or the great artists we have here. Um, I keep trying to talk people like John Paul Douglas into coming back to Orlando. Um, hopefully that'll happen. And if not, I mean, there's, there's a whole other stream of people like that. You know, just 
I think that it's all about us embracing what we have and what we've created. You know, things like how Gabby Lothrop, uh, she runs East End Market. I don't know if you guys have been there, but it's, I'd equate that to being an all year, like a year round farmer's market as good as something you'd see in San Francisco. And the fact that we have that in Orlando is really amazing. So we should, it's definitely a matter of us supporting local businesses and things that we think are cool and supporting artists that we think are identifiably Orlandoan. Um, so I, I, th I definitely feel like we're on the upswing and it's just a matter of us knowing that this place can be something really amazing, even though it already is amazing, but we can make it even more amazing. Yep, one more. Yes, sir. Uh, what are you working on right now that you're really excited about? Um, I've been doing a bunch of cameo stuff for a couple of bands. Actually, one of my, uh, a band that I was in when I was 16, they're still around, they're unsigned, Mindscar. Uh, they're, a, they're a black metal band, which is uh, music that's basically way heavier than what we do. Um, they, they asked me to do some guest stuff on it, so I just recorded a bunch of guest vocals for them, so I'm going to help them hopefully get that signed to something. Um, the Toyota scoring stuff, which I'm about to do, which is going to be really fun, is for some social media campaign that Toyota's doing. I think they contact me through John Paul. And that's, that's another, that kind of relates back to the, the previous question of friends helping friends in this. Like that Hightail video was all Orlando-based people. Um, keeping it within the family of our friends of Orlando people. I think that's, that's key. Um, I'm working on my side project band called Mritu. Um, it's being produced by one of my heroes, Ishan from Emperor, that guy I showed you with my guitar up there. Um, constantly cooking. Um, the newest big endeavor in my life is Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. That's, that's what this is from. It's not half eyeliner. Um, I'm really into that. That's a big part of my life now. So all I do when I'm home, people ask me what I do is cook, eat, see family and friends, and do Jiu Jitsu and yoga. So that kind of thing. So it, it's, it's about the band leading into that. And the reason why I do something like Jiu Jitsu is because the first time we toured in Brazil, I loved Brazil so much. I loved the people there and the food so much. I, I, just, I said to myself, I want to do what Brazilians do. And I found out that, that was soccer or jiu-jitsu. And I was like, I never really wanted to try soccer. Let's try the harder thing. And I always like to try the hardest thing first. Like first time I tried to cook something, it was, uh, it was Bourdain's stock recipe that he turned into demi-glace. It took like 18 hours, and that was the first thing I ever really made. <laughs> I like to give myself a challenge. But yeah, so thank you all very much for having me. Um, it was a pleasure. Thank you.